All right, everybody. This is Anthony Cole of IIFYM.com, and I am super excited and honored to have Dr. Lane Norton join us in today's – oh, look at those guns. Look at those. <laughs> Dr. Lane Norton join us in today's uh, interview. Um, so what? tell me uh, real quick, Lane, uh, the shirt. Uh-huh. I, I mean, I saw your – I saw your guns. Yeah, what is caffeine? Caffeine kilos. Yeah, the uh, random shirt I had on, but I got this shirt at the Arnold like a couple of years ago, and uh, they support a lot of powerlifting, a lot of USAPL stuff. So excellent. Uh, good company. Cool, cool. All right. Well, it's funny well, they, they actually do make coffee. Believe it or not. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna say that we'll be, we'll be hard pressed to find somebody who's watching this interview who doesn't know who you are. But for those people that have been living in a cave for a while and, and maybe those new to fitness and uh, people yeah. thinking about getting into competitive bodybuilding or uh, anybody that just doesn't know, give us a, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, what you're about. So everybody just all be on the same page. Yeah. I'll give the abridged version. Uh, so I'm a science geek who likes, likes to lift weights and build muscle and do all that good stuff. So got into lifting weights when I was a teenager because I got picked on and didn't get attention from girls. And it didn't fix either one of those problems, but uh, I did develop a uh, true love for lifting weights. And that kind of, that passion kind of led into um, wanting to pursue something in school that would be relevant to um, lifting weights and building muscle. So I did a bachelor's in biochemistry, and then I did my Ph.D. in nutritional sciences. Uh, along the way, won a pro card in natural bodybuilding, um, did pretty well in some natural pro shows, then transitioned to powerlifting, um, did pretty well in that too, won two national titles, got silver medal at Worlds. Um, and <clears throat> at the same time, I was in grad school, started my online coaching business full-time, uh, in about 2005, so I was doing online coaching before it was cool, before everybody did it. Uh, when did we work together? It would have been like 2000. 2000, 2000 my first show was 2010. It was November, so I, yeah. I started uh, 22 weeks out. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I thought it was around 2010. I was going to say 2009 or 2010. Um, so, yeah, it's funny. Like Looking back now, people go, oh, this guy. Yeah, yeah I worked with him. And the brain was like, oh, yeah, I worked with him one time, too. Like, it's just my client folder is so funny to look back at all the names, you know what I mean? But it's it's really cool. Um, you know, I, I, the journey has been pretty amazing. And just to see that, you know, when I started, you know, there was no online coaching. It was not a – it was not what it is today, which is, like, I would say that if you're a competitor and you're not an online coach, you're weird. <laughs> yeah. Everybody who competes just does it. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it started out as just something like, um, I guess just a hobby, um, not a hobby. I don't want to say that, but it started out as, you know, I did it because I was in grad school and I got, you know, I was writing for a lot of magazines and, and websites and, um, I got a lot of, uh, questions and a lot of people wanted me to write them programs and whatnot. And I did that for several years. Like when I was an undergrad, I would write people programs and nutritional strategies and all that kind of, and I wouldn't charge because I just didn't feel right because I didn't have a degree and I didn't consider myself a professional yet. Uh, no hate to anybody who doesn't have a science degree and coaches. Just that's, that was just me. That's just yeah. what I thought. And, um, but then when I got to grad school, it's kind of like, well, this is taking away time that I could be doing other stuff. So I kind of got to get something for my time. So that's when I, I started charging people. And, um, yeah, I just kind of grew by word of mouth and um, did pretty well in coaching, too, and some other stuff. And, yeah, now I just kind of do a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, it's great. You had, you had talked about, you know, the early days and how, like, we, we work together. And, um, you know, I'm uh, trying to be humble here. I'm, I'm nobody special. I mean, I, I am special. I'm fucking awesome. But, like, I'm just yeah. a regular dude right, that taps into his yeah. awesomeness, and I'm comfortable with that. But, like – I found that IIFYM.com. You've also worked with like uh, Alberto Nunez, right? And um, yeah. Eric Helms, 3 d worked with Alberto, worked with Eric Helms. I've worked with, I mean, if you can name him in the coaching industry, I probably worked with him at some point. You know, yeah. not, not everybody, but, um, you know, well, I, I'm blessed to say that, um, you know, 
uh, I think what is cool, uh, Peter Fitchin's another one, you know, yeah, like, great. Uh, uh, Paul Ravello, yeah. uh, Will Grazio. So I, I'm, I'm Lauren Conlon. I'm lucky to I just keep name dropping. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, a lot of people, I don't want to say they got into it because of me, but I, I know I kind of, you know, uh, fostered that for them, you know, and, and tried to help them. And, and uh, you know, we have more good, I can say that, you know, maybe, you know, I may not have a, 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 I have a good reach, but I wouldn't say it's enormous, you know. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more good coaches out there today, I think, uh, hopefully because I had some some impact on that. Yeah, you you laid the groundwork for um, the framework for a, a lot of us to, to follow. You set the example early. I remember being on the bodybuilding.com forums and um, seeing, you know, I, I had a guy private message me on the forums. He goes, hey, my name is whatever, and uh, I do online coaching, and I here's how it works. And he, he was just spamming a bunch of people through private message. Yeah. And I'm like, this shit is never going to take on. Who the hell would hire somebody on the internet to tell me? <laughs> and I'm thinking like, I have a personal trainer at the gym and like this guy's spotting me and helping me law, you know, and we're progressing at a certain pace. And I'm like, yeah. this guy can't, he's not even going to be here. What can he do? Now that wasn't you to be fair, right, right, but, right. but that was, that was in the early days. And, um, yeah. Man, to see everybody's career just blossom and take off from from those from from where we all started and, and well and to look, see at it, it. look at it this way look at it this way you know your website ifym if it fits your macros yeah like, flexible dieting was when I started on the forums was blasphemy you know <laughs> what I mean like absolute blasphemy it's basically me and Alan Argon and. You know, I think Eric Kornreich is the one who coined the term. Oh, yes, yeah, Eric. Yeah, I had that conversation with him. I'm like, bro, I got the domain name. I, you, what do you want to do? He's like, yeah, it's, take it. I'm fucking done with that shit. Yeah, so, um, yeah, because we just kept repeating, well, if, you know, can I have an apple? Well, if it fits your macros, yeah, can I have this? If it fits your macros, you know? And so that's kind of where the acronym uh, sprung up out of was just those forums, you know? And uh, people just couldn't believe that you could, you know, that you could eat foods that, you know, it wasn't even so much like pop tarts and candy. That became more like um, counterculture. It just uh, just to prove a point. Yeah, right? that's exactly what it is. It was just okay. Look, I'm eating pop tarts and I'm shredded. All right, do, do you get it now? Like I think you got to on an apple. It was more like saying, "Hey, you don't have to eat tilapia six times a day with white rice or brown rice or whatever. You know, you can throw a steak in there. You can throw." You know, you can have uh, something else. Like, it doesn't have to be just those set meals. You can have variety. That's more of what it was about. That's now, how it started, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it, I remember the first time I saw it, it, it was about a protein bar. Can I have a yeah. protein bar? And so one of the four or five guys that were like, yeah, you can. Yes. If it fits yeah. your macros, you can. And then it was like a few months, like, how about chocolate cake? How, how about peanut <laughs> butter with Skittles? <laughs> and then you see yeah. it on Instagram. Because, look, nobody's taking – I mean, people do, but not as many people are taking pictures of tilapia and asparagus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, and it's like, no, here's good. my amazing, you know, um, uh, Jorge uh, Rosado, right? Like, he's doing, like, yeah. uh, like the pan like pancakes, like, that are, like, amazing yeah. stacks and gorgeous pancakes, another protein pancakes, and they look better than maybe they taste. But I would still smash those things. But <laughs> the counterculture – came to be because people are just like look what we can do and then unfortunately so many people think that's what ifym and flexible dieting is and it's like yeah. try to hit your macros eating nothing but pop tarts it just doesn't yeah and that's that's the thing right like i always tell people i think the best way to describe it i like to use finances because i think finances yeah. seem a little more concrete to people so i say you know if you want to save money you better have a budget right like you know for most people you don't make enough money to to just kind of spend it like a drunk congressman. You got to have some kind of budget, you know? Um, well, it's the same thing with your, with your nutrition, right? Like now, listen, if you're a macro millionaire and <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're on 500 grams of carbohydrate a day and hundred grams of fat, I mean, you're going to be able to hit your protein, uh, fiber and micronutrient targets and still have probably quite a bit left over. Yeah, absolutely. So you have some, you know, Reese's Pieces or Skittles or whatever, like it's not going to hurt you, you know? And um, I think that was, and actually for some people who are really have that high budget, 
you know, like I had a guy one time, he was on 700 grams of carbohydrate and he just had a real fast metabolism. Di- dieting? Like not weight- dieting. Not dieting. Okay, he, but he, was- he was maintaining his weight on 700 grams of carbs. Like oh, my gosh. Grams of fat. Um, and he came to me and he was like, man, he's like, I'm telling you, like, he's like, I feel so terrible, bloated, and gross. And I'm like, well, what are you eating? Well, he was only eating, like, oatmeal, broccoli, and chicken. And I'm like, dude, no. like, and, and then fish oil and, um, and, and peanut butter. That's, and I'm like, well, dude, that's because you're eating 150 grams of fiber a day. Like, your, your <laughs> digestive tract is literally backed up to your esophagus, you know? Like, you're literally full of shit. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I said, you know, hit your macros, but, like, go have some pizza. Go have something that's a little more calorie dense. Orange so juice. Not, so you're not having to, like, force so much food volume yeah. down. And he lost three pounds in three days and basically shit, like, five times. And I felt, bet. Yeah. So he's like, oh, my God, I feel so much better. My training's better, you know. So now if you're somebody who's, you know, on poverty macros, you know, and you're on less than 100 grams of carbs a day, you know, good luck trying to make Skittles fit. <laughs> yeah, right. You can probably do it, but you're going to be really damn hungry. Oh, you get six Skittles. That's how it yeah. works. <laughs> you get and, sick. And, and so what you find is people end up self-selecting. Like when I'm dieting down, Sohi, Sohi Lee did a really great um, – kind of, I don't want to call it experiment, but she did, um, when she won a pro card, she had a Snickers bar every day during prep. And about four weeks into it, she's like, I hate having to eat this. Uh-oh. Like, this is 30 grams of carbs and 10 grams of fat just gone. Yeah. So, and it's tiny. At so that point, gonna, give me the oatmeal and the peanut butter. Yeah, give me the, like, you know. I'd rather have a really huge salad right now. You yeah. Know? And so what you find is that when you're, when you're dieting down, you're going to self-select for foods that are less calorie dense just so you can feel satiated, right? So the same thing. If you're on higher macros, you're, I think the point where, you know, the people are in flexible dieting trying to make an IFYM is that, okay, you don't have to – because we have this thing called disinhibition reflex where, you know, if you stick somebody in a room – and you tell them there's five doors in the room. You tell them you can go in any place you want. And there's no one. You do whatever you want. But for the love of God, don't go in that door. That's like, it. You know, I, I, you, what's the immediately? What when you get obsessed about what's in that room? That's it. Like it is human nature. So if you tell somebody like a Sohi's coach, her first coach told her you can't have cookies. She's like, I never even liked cookies. And then like I found myself like obsessing over cookies because I couldn't have them. Right. Yeah. So that was the same thing, like, during my preps, I, when I first kind of did it grow style, not not via anybody's recommendation, but just because that's what everybody did. That's what we were doing. Um, I found myself craving shit that I never even thought about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the point is that, like, you can have these things, and it doesn't turn into a, a binge-eating fiesta because, you know, it's like it doesn't feel like a cheat because if you hit your numbers, you didn't cheat. Right? Yeah, yeah. Let's that's let's, powerful, let's that's that's powerful for some people. It's huge. I mean, let let's talk for a minute about sustainability. Um, in, in in line with giving into my cravings versus cheat meals versus refeeds. Like, if I'm allowed to have, or am I encouraged to have a, a sweet or something that I'm actually craving? And there's a mathematical equation, a formula where I can fit it into my stuff and. You know, that makes it actually sound a lot more complicated than, than it is. It's like if I could fit that candy bar or my cravings into my into my diet, whether I'm training for a contest or I'm a gen pop type of a client that just is trying to get healthy to set the example for my children, um, it's far more sustainable to eat the foods that we love as opposed to force feeding ourselves food that we would never eat under any other circumstances in the world. Now, some people, they naturally, you know, vegans or going to be eating selected food paleo you could you know there's certain diets that will lend themselves and you can hit macros or whatever and some people just like eating what they consider to be health food and clean or whatever that is but um let's talk a little bit about sustainability and and, and what you've noticed maybe with your clients um contest prep versus somebody who is not trying to go to those extreme levels and just wants to uh, fit into their wedding dress or you know get their confidence back yeah i think that um 
you know, people make big differences between competitors and the general population, but I've seen a lot of similarities, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, the only difference is competitors get way leaner. Competitors tend to be – everything Gen Pop is, competitors tend to be more of. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know. What they, I tell people is that the only difference is the length of time we do the diet. Is yeah. We diet for longer. <laughs> now, people say, well, I don't care about sustainability. I'm competing. Like, I, all I care about is getting lean for that one day. Okay, but are you only going to compete one time, right? Because if you blow up after the show and, and now you've put yourself, you know, you've added more fat than you, you ever had before you started dieting, which happens all the time, by the way. Yeah. Um, and now you've actually made it harder for you to get leaner in the future. Whereas if you had a more sustainable approach, something that, you know, maybe you, you only put on 10, 15 pounds, and now it's easier to get back to that level of leanness and you can do – uh, be be better at the shows that you're doing, right? Especially if you're a natural competitor, you know, like people think, oh, I, I got to bulk up in the off season and put, put on all this muscle. You, you're going to, where you're going to make your money as a natural competitor is retaining it during the diet. Is it? That's where, because when they look at the scientific research, 30%, 30% of your weight you lose on average during a contest prep as a natural bodybuilder is lean body mass. 30%. So if you can do better than better than than thirty percent, you're 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 doing well. You're winning, yeah. right? Like that's it. So and that's not a, 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 a an unreasonable expectation for some people. But if you start out and you've got fifty pounds to lose in sixteen weeks, good luck. You know what I mean? So I think that that's kind of one of the points I, I like to make about when people say, "Well, I don't care about. I just want to get ready for this one show." And I've had I had three guys this year. I actually, they were doing transformation challenges, and I really had to have a, a a really firm talk to to be like, listen, you have to listen to me, okay? I know you're doing this transformation challenge. I know you want to lose as much weight as you can, but you will put it all back on if you do not treat this post diet period with the same intensity and yeah. focus that you did as the competition prep. Okay, so you know if you look at the research, you know people put it back on. Ninety-five percent of people will put everything they lost back on. Gen pop competitors, whoever they put it all back on. So I, I think sustainability is the most important thing. You know because whatever it is, you know Sohi had a great quote. She said, "If the diet you're on, if you can't see yourself being on that that style, that that way of of living, you know obviously like you can't live on." 1800 calories, well, you can, but it'd be miserable. Yeah. You can't live on 1800 calories a day forever, right? But the style, the way you diet, right? If you're doing 1800 calories a day and it's all oatmeal, tilapia, and broccoli, you know, you're not going to want to. But if you're tracking macros and you're allowed some freedom with your foods, it's something you can continue doing. Now, I think, you know, some people, some people have a little problem with. Too much flexibility. It is. Them or they, um, if they don't, you know, people, especially who are OCD, my girlfriend Holly tends to be like this. Like, she will, she will, <laughs> if she overeats one day, she won't actually put it into that day's food. She will put it into the next day or the day after or something like that so that all her numbers match at the end of the day because she hates not having her numbers match. So does eat less the next day to make up for it. So she'll come right. down. Yeah. Right, right. So, but some people, we, we have a joke running that, like, oh, babe, just to hit your macros from last year, all you got to do is fast for the next 77 days. You'll be That's fine. it. I've, I've, I've worked that yeah. out of my head sometimes. I'm like, all right, yeah. okay, two months. All I have to do is not eat for two months, and I'm good. Exactly. So, uh, and that's, you know, that's, again, like where intermittent fasting and, and all these things, you can take it too far, right, yeah. when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing that kind of stuff. But um, that's more of a joke we have between us. But, the 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 point is some people like obsess about those numbers. If they don't hit those numbers, it still triggers a binge for them. Yeah. You know, they could be five grams over on carbs. And oh. so for those for those people, they probably need more structure. You know, yeah. they probably need that more structure. Um, or, you know, people have talked about what about intuitive eating? I think intuitive eating is always kind of like the long term goal. Yeah, sure. When you're when you're when you're getting anybody especially a non-competitor in the diet, right? But that's, we're talking about the deep end of the pool. 
If people could intuitively eat, we wouldn't have the obesity crisis, right? Because if we just ate when we were hungry, there wouldn't be a problem, right? Yeah, but well, we are eating based on our intuition, and our intuition just tells us to keep on going because we haven't practiced the, the right type of eating for our goal. Right. And so so my, my, what I consider intuitive eating is what I do personally. Now, again, people will argue with me about this, and that's fine. That's probably going to fit the definition of intuitive eating that's out there. But I, I don't weigh most things. If I'm home and I have the time, I'll weigh it, you know, and I'll track it. Um, but I don't have, I don't use any dedicated tracker necessarily. Um, I'm just old school. I just throw it in my notes on my iPhone and I just guesstimate down to the five, five grand. You know what I mean? But you've also been doing this long enough to know what four ounces versus six ounces of chicken breast. And that's like. the point. And I, but I never would have known that if I hadn't tracked for a really long time yeah. diligently. Right. And I can tell you if I was competing in a show, I would be, you'd be doing it. everything tracking everything, doing because that's where those little things really make a big difference. I mean, you almost have to become obsessive if you're doing a show, as bad as it sounds. You really do, because it's, you know, again, like, you don't have to, but if you want to win, if you want to do your absolute best. You need every advantage you can take. You need, you need to get everything you can, because like I said, you know, 30% is going to be lean body mass. If you can beat that, you're doing yeah. better than most people, right? Um, so what I consider, you know, like Holly cooked a nice dinner tonight. Like we had uh, bacon wrapped chicken with cat with red peppers. She calls them capsicums because she's Australian. Uh, what does she call them? Capsicums. Oh, okay, peppers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, there's so much terminology I had to learn. Um, and then uh, like stuff with ricotta cheese. And I'm just looking at it. I'm like, nah, that's yeah. That's probably about 70 grams of protein, about 35 grams of carbs, and about. 12 grams, you know what I mean? And am I going to be off? Yeah, probably, but I'm probably not going to be that far off. Yeah. You know, and if I'm, especially if I'm eating most of the same things every day and I track them the same way every time. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're pretty, you're pretty lean. You're probably under 15, 12 to 15%, I would imagine, right? Yeah. If I caliper, I'm at eight. So reality is probably more about 11. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's, that, that's in shape. That's in shape. And when you're in shape, you will notice the small fluctuations. So like, if two weeks yeah. goes by and all of a sudden, wait a second, this wasn't what happened to my serratus or what happened to my, my abs are a little blurry today. Yeah. Like, uh, okay, maybe I need to pull back and maybe I've been off a little bit. But again, if you were dieting for a show, different story right now. Yeah. You're just I, mean, I can tell you, I will maintain my weight within 1% of my body weight. If I go travel for a week and a half, two weeks, I won't go outside that 1% on average, you know, and that's not even, that's not even weighing stuff. You know, I'm not, I don't take a food scale with me most places. It's just, I've been doing this so long. I can look at food and know what's in it, but I never would have gotten that way if I hadn't started out. The most you will ever learn about nutrition is just learning what's in food. Yeah, yeah. The most you will ever learn. I remember, you know, because I'm a dinosaur. I started back in 2001 with my first competition. So I had... We we didn't have my fitness pal. No. We didn't have my macros. We didn't have all these. You had a notebook and a pen. Dude, you had the complete book of food counts. I think I still got one lying around around here somewhere about this thick, you know, and had every single food in there that you could think of. And you'd have to go through. Oh, but, but when I started, I didn't know what a high protein food was. I didn't know what a high carb food was. I didn't know what a high fat food was. I started going, oh, oh my God, shit, pizza's really high in fat and carbs. Oh my God. <laughs> Imagine oh, that. Oh my God. Damn it. <laughs> you know, so, but I learned so much by doing that, you know, to learn, oh, well, that, I actually like that food. And that actually fits really well. You know, like one of the foods I actually really got into eating that I liked was uh, popcorn, like air pop popcorn. Oh, yeah. Because it's so voluminous. It is. You know, this is always what I use to break the clean eating argument, right? Because it, they go, if you ask somebody, was well, a sweet potato clean? Go, oh, yeah, sweet potato is clean. Was well, popcorn clean? No, 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 no. Really, air pop popcorn is not clean. No, no, no. Well, okay, well, it has more fiber than a sweet potato, more volume per serving, and more protein. So, you know, what is your – what's your – Yeah, what is your – how are you defining that? And then, you know, my, my favorite is – the great battle cry of the clean eaters is, but what about micronutrients? So, which I always say, if I can get them on the spot in person, I'll say, oh, yeah, what's your vitamin K intake per day? <laughs> Funny enough, they never, they never know. 
you know? And actually, uh, Holly, uh, funny enough, you know, she's a registered dietitian. When she was in Australia, uh, when she was living there, uh, there were some guys at her gym who were like, uh, you know. I'm listening. I just, I just did, I did want to just show you this that, uh, you know, <laughs> I actually could tell you, but. <laughs> That's right. funny. So, um, they were actually, uh, bodybuilders, you know, bro style, you know, looking to get their pro card, the IPD. And she actually did a nutrition analysis on a couple of these guys and found that they were frank deficient in some nutrients and were almost like toxic levels of uh, micronutrients like selenium and some sure. other. Well, when all you eat is the same six foods nonstop, exactly. you don't have any variety. You're not getting the micros. You're getting a lot from over here. And yeah. And that's actually uh, Eric Trexler, who's now a big researcher in uh, the exercise and nutrition realm. He's finishing his PhD at uh, UNC in uh, Dr. Abby Smith Ryan's lab. He was the first person to win the BioLane grant uh, years ago. Excellent. Uh, really smart guy. Really smart guy. And um, he, when he was in Ohio State doing his undergrad, they just did like a pilot study. He was telling me about where they looked at. They didn't publish it, but it was a pilot study. And they looked at uh, people who did paleo versus people who just trekked macros and looked at their nutrition analysis of the micronutrients. And found that pretty much the same thing. The people on paleo were really high in some micros and fright deficient in others. Whereas yeah. people who flexibly dieted, they had some, like a lot of people were deficient in like vitamin D and, um, and, and some other vitamins that are in minerals. That, like iron actually is a big one. A lot of people are deficient in iron. Um, so like, but, um, but overall, the people on flexible dieting had a better spectrum yeah, sure. Vitamin and mineral, and just like you said, because you're getting a variety of foods. Like that's how mankind is intended. Yeah. Know? Did you, Did you ever read my my blog post on on IFWM about how I define clean foods? Huh. No, I never did. Okay, so I had a, I get I had the same conversation that you've probably had many times. Yeah. I don't engage with the trolls on online anymore. I've established myself enough just to, I don't have to, and I don't care. But like, oh, every once in a while you got to, uh, you know, I'll jump in just to be like, Dink, there you go. Um, but the, so I'm, I'm really struggling with how can I define this? Because I use the term clean eating or clean foods in my blog posts, because if I tell you go eat clean, you know what I'm talking about. Like we no gravy. I think a good way to define what most people intuitively think of is single ingredient foods and that's exactly that's exactly what my thing was and that's how i did it was a single ingredient food it was like broccoli baked potato baked potato with butter no okay and then my thing i wrote and i wrote this six or seven years ago I was like okay anthony what about butter is butter clean i'm like yeah. if you eat it by itself absolutely it's a clean food but good luck scarfing down butter by itself like right there's gonna always be like some things that don't fit and that's the, and that and that's the thing is any definition of clean eating has somewhere it breaks down. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and it's, it's very individual. You know, vegans would say that meat's not clean. Right? Oh, yeah. No, I know a lady who is, thinks it's irresponsible to eat anything other than local, organic, raw, um, vegan food. That's, that's her diet. That, that is her, like, locally sourced, organic, raw, like, vegetables. And, uh, that's and all she, she hates does. her life. I, I don't, I mean, and she's... Nice person. But when, you at, is, when you look at her, you can tell she's malnourished. Well, that's the thing. I mean, there's, there's actually, there's and tragically, there's actually babies every year that die because their parents insist on feeding their kid vegan, yeah. their baby vegan. Yeah. And they die because they get malnourished. Like I actually read something the other day. I think it was in, I actually think it was in Arizona or New Mexico, somewhere out there. That a, a vegan couple had done that, and they're actually they're, they're pressing charges. Yeah, they, as they should. I mean, that's child abuse. No, I mean, look at, the baby. Okay, so the mother, the milk of the mother is not vegan. That that's and that is the most natural fucking thing there yeah. is for a baby. Like, yeah, no, it's it's. I, I get this this debate sometimes, and people say something like, "Well, humans were never intended to drink cow's milk." Yeah, well, they weren't intended to fucking wear clothes and. <laughs> fly and drive cars but it doesn't mean that something isn't helpful just because we weren't intended to do it you know right. yeah so, like you know for example dairy there's a big stink about dairy you know especially after what the health and oh my um, gosh <laughs> yeah my my eyeballs bled from watching that um 
you know, and, and you know, every study we have says that, you know, as long as you're not have a lactose intolerance, people who eat dairy are, are tend to be leaner, better bones, uh, healthier overall, you know? So I, you know, I, I, had, I had a girl one time criticize me knowing I'm the founder of IFWAM.com. She, I had posted something about I'm two weeks out from a show. So I'm dropping my, uh, my, my, my Greek yogurt and my, my dairy products that I had. And, and she jumped on me like, oh, what's, you know, Anthony, what's going on, bro? And, like, she capitalized, like, put bro separately. And uh, I was like, uh, actually, I'm lactose intolerant, and um, I bloat. But I like dairy, so yeah. I eat it. And then two weeks from a show, I stop, and I'll drop about three pounds overnight because, yeah. you know, so, like, there are reasons to avoid certain foods, and there are reasons yeah. to eat certain foods. And if we just – get on that zealot train and say, this is the way uh, paleo is the way your keto is the way. Like even me, like I believe I I F Y M is the best because it's the most sustainable because you can do paleo and you can do whatever. That doesn't mean it's yeah, all, all I F Y M is, it's just a system of tracking. A system of you can do any other diet and do I F Y M. Yeah. You know? and, right. And then, so that's what I tell people. IFYM. Just so the, thank you back from keto. People ask me what would they think the best my I think the best diet is, and I'm like, the most sustainable diet for you. Yeah, whatever, what you, whatever you can stick to. That's it has to start with adherence and sustainability, and then you build out from there. You know, that's you know Eric Helms had the 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 pyramids, the pyramids. muscle and strength pyramids, which were excellent books. You know, code barley. Uh, <laughs> um, but he talked about this a lot is, you know, adherence is the number one thing. He went through the reasons why. It's, it's 100% true, you know. So, but a great, example, a great example of this is like, um, you know, like I said, Holly is uh, celiac. So she actually can't have gluten. If she has gluten, like, it's bad news. You know what yeah. I mean? So um, for those, but unfortunately, people will take that and say, well, you know, this thing does this to me. So it must be bad. Yeah. Well, no. You know, it's not bad. It's just bad for you, right? It's just the same way if you were allergic to penicillin. Penicillin has saved billions of lives over the course of time. It doesn't, but if you're allergic to penicillin, yeah, penicillin is bad for you. But it doesn't mean everybody else should stop taking penicillin. No, but penicillin, we don't eat penicillin at the restaurants. It's not a social thing. It's not, there's not an identity attached to it. Exactly, and that's right. Uh, and you brought up a good point of, uh, you know, a lot of people discount the social nature of food. Anybody who's been through prep knows that you kind of become a hermit. Uh, yeah, you do. At you a certain can. point, you can't. Not, not, not because you necessarily want to, but because it's like, all right, I got to go to this thing. Well, now people are going to ask me why I'm not eating this. People are going to say, they're going to talk about my prep. And then it's going to be, I'm going to have to go through why I'm doing this. And then it just, you know, it just ends up being like, Almost like, okay, well, this is more trouble than it's worth. You know yeah. what I mean? Then you so, have the same conversation over and over and over again. It's like, I, I, I don't want to talk about macros anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, just, so I just don't. You're just, you're just, I can't be, CBF, as Holly says, can't be fucked. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, you just can't, you can't deal with it anymore. You know, and that's, uh, I remember like going back, looking at old videos of me prepping in 2010 for my pro shows. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm like talking slow. You know, like I'm actually speaking slow. Like anybody who's ever met me knows I go a million miles an hour. Yeah, you, know? you do. And uh, yeah, I'm like sitting there watching and I'm like, I'm even, I'm even fucking blinking slowly. Like that's how bad it was. Like my meat must've been like this, you yeah, know, like nothing. I can remember like laying on the couch and there was a TV show and I didn't like. But the remote was, like, the remote was too far. The remote's like the other side of the couch. And I'm just like, uh, nah. Babe. I'll, babe. I'll, I'll deal with this. I'll just, just somebody, does anybody have a lasso or anything? You know? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, it's true. We get, we get, you know, we're glycogen depleted. We've been doing it for so long. And what I tell people is like, look, I can smash a whole fucking pizza right now. And I'll love oh. every second of it. And in an hour, I'll be just as miserable because yep. number one, um, my hormones are still tanked, and number two, I just smashed a whole pizza, and now I got to do cardio for the next five <laughs> days to help me go. And that the, all that yeah. guilt comes in. And and while I'm I'm there, can you um, can you talk a little bit about um, 
let, let, let me back up. Well, um, right now at IFYM.com, one of the things that we're doing is we're restructuring the entire company. And the, the metric that we're using moving forward to j- gauge our success is, uh, is no longer based on profitability or sales or revenue. It's only based on the success of our clients. How many people finish our program? And to do that, we had to reestablish a new mission, a new identity statement. And, and the big thing is, is like our mission is to help people lose weight while eating the foods they love so that they can restore their relationship with food and learn to love their body again. That's the elevator statement of what we do, right? But the big part is restore their relationship with food. And some people never had a healthy relationship yeah. with food. And so can you speak a little bit to maybe when you work with clients, um, the how you help people obviously macros and food choices make it a little bit more flexible and sustainable, but like really get them to to understand and, and the, the, to rebuild that relationship with food in a, in a healthy way that they don't feel that guilt and that shame for eating the cheesecake or eating something that they've been told is, is bad or fattening or, I mean, yeah, education plays a part counseling to some degree. If there's underlying, you know, disease that has to be addressed with more than just food and counseling. But, you know, like, yeah, sure. But what is it that you do as a coach when you have a client that is feeling guilty and, and, and has a hard time overcoming the emotional connection to food? Yeah, I mean, I just had um, a gal who, you know, I've been doing with this very thing. She actually sent me a message last week and she said, yeah, I had an apple and I didn't feel guilty. And I, she's like, thank you. She's like, I can't believe I'm eating an apple. An apple. Not feeling like, you know, I'm I'm a bad person. I, I think one of it is the way you talk to clients. You know, like I'm very, um, I will be direct. You know, I mean, you've you've worked with me. I'm direct. Yeah. But I'm also not, uh, I'm not a browbeater. You know what I mean? Like if somebody screws up, they're gonna beat themselves up way more than I ever will. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't need to shove their face in it. Um. You know, what I'll tell people is, you know, I've, I must have said this exact line a thousand times in my coaching career, if not more. And I said, listen, you paid your money. I want you to be happy. Okay. You know, now, if that means you being at a higher body fat, eating more food, great. Who am I to say what's right for you? Okay. But, you know, and especially contest prep clients, like, listen, I don't care if you finish dead last. I just want you to be happy. But I don't think you're going to be happy with dead last. So if you if your goal is to win, your actions have to reflect that. Okay. But it's never you dumb this and that like or you know yeah. you just don't need willpower. You know you need to buck up. You know this and that like you know. People, There's coaches that do that though. Oh God, I've seen conversations from people who have come to me from other coaches, and I'm just like, how do these people not get sued or like? Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely mind blowing um, that some of these people are still in business. And listen, you know, I'm not going to say I'm always perfect, and I've always, you know, been a great coach to every single person. I probably, I, I have made mistakes. Like everybody's going to make mistakes, you know. Um, but I like to think I get it right most times, and I yeah. get my interactions right. You know, uh, one thing I'll never. I, I had a guy. He was a pro bodybuilder. And I was kind of hard on him. Um, he was a pro. Um, uh, men's classic bodybuilding, and he just kept overeating. And I'm like, listen, man, like, and he was already, he was like, because there's a weight limit for that. Yeah. And you know, he was already, he came to me with six, I think six weeks, and he had like 25, 20 pounds to go. And I'm like, listen, this is gonna be really, really hard. Okay, it's doable, but it's gonna be really hard, and you've got to be on your game. And then like. A few different times we've had problems. I'm like, listen, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you for what you did. However, you're a professional, and the people you're going up against are professionals. If you want to do well, you need to apply extra effort. You know, and I think I probably got that from my grad school advisor, Dr. Layman. You know, he was an awesome advisor. But to be honest with you, for the first couple of years of grad school, I sucked ass. Like, I didn't get any research done, um, mostly because my first experiment was an unmitigated disaster. Um, it, long story, I don't want to get everything into it. It's just, 
I was just inexperienced. And, you know, everybody, it, when it comes to find out, everybody fails in grad school. But I failed my first experiment. It just, it was just poorly designed and poorly executed on my part. And, um, you know, I just, I got, uh, I froze. Like, I got stuck. You know what I mean? And I just kind of stopped trying. It was just kind of going through the motions. Like, I wasn't progressing like I should. And I remember um, it, it was about halfway through my grad school experience, I would say. I was about two and a half years in. And uh, I, I had actually um, missed a lab meeting. I remember this. And he was like, I would like to see you in my office. And so I went to the office. He was like, close the door. So I closed it because I knew I was in the shit. You know what I mean? And he was like, listen, PhDs aren't for everybody. Um, but if you want to study protein metabolism, you are at the best university in the United States to study this. Nobody else does what we do. So if you don't really want this, then let's switch you to a master's program and we can let somebody who really wants this take this spot. And you know, he never yelled at me. He never got upset. He was just very direct and very matter of fact. And you know what? It was exactly what I needed. I remember, I remember he's like, because he's like, honestly, if you keep this up, you're going to go on probation from the program. And I just remembered, you know, that was, it was like that, you know? And I just remember looking at him like, yep, this is 100% my fault and I'm going to fix it. You know, and at, at, right after that day, things started getting better, you know, because it was the, it was the, it wasn't the, it wasn't a kick in the ass. It wasn't a punch in the face. It was kind of like your dad putting his arm around you and telling you what you needed to hear, not what you wanted to hear. You know what I mean? And I, I try to do my coaching like that. I try to, you know, like I said, I am direct, sometimes uncomfortably so for some people who aren't used to that. Um, but I'm not mean. I'm not a browbeater. You know, I, I remember you You were always, um, like, when, when my first show, I started at 195, and I got down to 155, and I probably still had another five pounds to go. I didn't realize that I didn't have the muscle mass that I thought I had and yeah. how much muscle I would burn. I was a skinny dude, right? Like, I'm 193 right now at about 9 or 10%. So, like, it's taken a long time to get there. Yeah, but you you never shamed me for being skinny and being like I'm and men's physique didn't exist. It was yeah. bodybuilding. I stepped on stage with bodybuilders that yeah. were six inches shorter than me and fifteen pounds heavier, and you were always compassionate. There was a level of firmness. Yeah, but there was also compassion. Um, yeah, with, with you. No, and what I'm looking for in clients is let's get them to the best they can be. Right, yeah. like some people just ain't gonna be Phil Heath, bro. You know, no. I mean? like, some people ain't going to be Doug Miller. Like, I remember I worked with a gal. She was uh, 55 at the time. I worked with a lovely lady. Um, and the her old coach, who's one of the most notorious, terrible figure and bikini coaches out there, just awful, um, he, had, was, he had a posing clinic. And she was there, and she was posing next to a 21-year-old bikini girl. And he looks at this this 55-year-old woman, and he says, you really need to look more like her. You fucking stupid dude. <laughs> like, plus, like, just, just, like, the emotional, like, like, some people are very, like, you don't know what somebody's gone through in their life. Like, some no. people send them right back down, like, a, a, a really bad place, you know? Yeah. It, it did for her. You know, it did for her. And, um, you know, that's the thing. Like, I, I always – I don't ever want to body shame somebody. No. I mean, and so it's it, – the conversation is, okay, well, you, you probably don't have enough – like, I, you know, the conversation we probably had, I don't remember it specifically, but it was probably, well, you don't have enough size to really be competitive. But, hey, this is your first time around. Yeah. You got pretty darn lean. And, you know, you should be proud of what you've done. That's Yeah, you sent me an email afterwards saying you've done something that, like, less than 1% of the population will ever do. And, yet, you know, I hope you're happy with it because you, you really killed it. You did your best, and it, and it showed. And that was – that actually that meant a lot to me to, to hear that because I know that, I, I you know, I'm not a big guy. I just never – I mean, I've seen your picture of you running on the track, and it's like <laughs> we both come a long way, you know. And, yeah. um, you know, so to, to, to have that – 
And I think that's an important point too, because I mean, like, look at that. Like, you know, that was seven years ago. Look how far you've come. Yeah. You're not going to be 155 on stage. No, you know? no. You're probably going to be in the 170s, is my guess. Yeah, last show I was 175, and um, I, I I won two uh, back-to-back masters, so I you know yeah. qualified. So, but look. Look how that's really important when you're natural. Look how long this takes, right? It takes, it takes a long time. I think, you know, like you said, so one of the things is when it comes to foods or when people have overeaten or people have even binge eaten, it's never, well, just stop doing that or you're weak or you're this or you're that. Like that, that doesn't help anybody. No. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm firm when I need to be firm with people, but it's never a, a I'm never trying to make somebody feel guilty about what they've done, you mm-hmm. know? And I think that probably helps me as a coach because people are more likely to open up and tell me, like, you sure. know, it's like, it's kind of like saying, like having a kid and saying, son, you can talk to me about anything. You know, if you, if you just come and tell me, you won't be in trouble, just come and tell me, you know? And then the son says, dad, I, you know, um, I, I smoke weed. I'm really sorry. And you go, okay, you're grounded for six months. Well, yeah. you're never, he's never going to talk to you again. You know, yep. and it's the same thing with your clients. If, if they do something and you react so negatively that they feel guilty, they're just not going to tell you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. or they're going to have a really miserable experience. So, I think if I could, you know, press upon coaches out there, like really try not to be, try to get your clients to do as best as they can do. Winning, we always want our clients to win. You know, like everybody wants the experience like I had with Lauren Conlon where I'm at the show and she wins the entire nationals, the overall wins pro card, all that kind of stuff. Like everybody wants that kind of experience. But that, you should also get just as much like joy out of seeing somebody who didn't have great genetics, who came a really long way and maybe they got fifth or sixth but that was the best damn thing they could have done. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's same thing, like, listen, I always want to win. You know, I'm a very competitive guy. You know me. I'm very competitive. I got second in the world in, um, in 2015 in powerlifting in my weight class. And I was very happy with that because it was the, you know, I, I'm not naive. I'm not going to, you know, Christoph was a fucking beast. He pulls like 800 pounds. You know, I'm not going to beat him. It's just unless he breaks his leg on his first deadlift. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that was the best I possibly could have done. So people go, oh, well, I'm disappointed if I don't win. I'm only disappointed if I don't win if I know I had the potential to win and didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah, but absolutely. If I, gave, if I gave it everything I had and came up a little bit short and it was the best performance I could have had, how am I going to be upset about that? You know what I mean? Especially in bodybuilding too, where it's so subjective. Oh my god! You know, like so if you know you're at your best ever, you know, and I, this is what I tell people who complain about politics and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, listen, show up at your best. If you keep showing up at your best and you keep improving, you're gonna start doing well. Okay? Yeah. Like, there is no grand conspiracy about this local show. No, like, no, they don't stop, care. Stop it. Stop Nobody it. cares not, about you. You're not that important. You know what I mean? Now, am I saying that local politics never played into anything? I'm not saying. What I am saying is if you consistently show up good, you are going to get rewarded for that. You know, like, again, Lauren Conlon, I don't don't curry favor with anyone. I've never sat down and, like, nudged the judge and be like, hey, 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 hey. You know, and Lauren won the overall at at, at the biggest bikini show in in history up to that point. You know, so it is possible. and it can be done, but you just keep showing up. That's the biggest yeah. thing. Maya, uh, I did a show last year, um, July, and I um, I got dead last. Um, and I, after getting third at a San Diego show, oh, that's um, the worst, isn't it? Yeah. Really well, then. And, and, and San Diego, San Di- oh, no, I'm sorry, fourth. It was fourth. Um, but still. San Diego um, Muscle Contest, John Lindsay Productions. Those guys are big out in San Diego. Oh, those, men, those, those boys are big. And I was able to keep up. And, and I, 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 you know, so then, you know, not too long, far later, I did a, a show here in Mesa, Arizona, Miles um, Productions. And I, okay, there was a couple guys I thought I had. And I didn't think I deserved last. And um, I, <sighs> But I knew I didn't deserve any better than 14th. 
Yeah. I ended up 16th. And, and the reason why is because I didn't do what I knew I needed to do. I know how to diet. I know how to train. I, you know, and I just, it, I'd already done two or three shows and it, and I, I just got kind of beat down and I just, Plus that intensity. but when I was the last one back there and they don't say, okay, first five makes five makes, you know, when you're in the last call out, it's like, okay, everybody else. And yeah, you're, you're like, all right, me and that other, those two, everybody else, um, that hurt. That feeling. It was painful. It, I'm smiling because that's what you do on stage, no matter what. But like, that was the fuel I needed. Yeah. So ten weeks later, I um, I won two back to back masters classes. You know, but well, I did my I mean, best. At the previous time, I did not. Whether it's business school you know what you experienced was dr layman pulled me into his office you know what i mean yeah it's probably the same sinking feeling you know what i mean like but if you're you know what they say is um failure defeats losers and inspires winners you know what i mean the failure defeats losers losers inspires winners and it's you know what that's that's perfect and i i see that more in, in the biz I, in the business world like that's the first place i go like i don't know how many failures I've had that have ultimately led me oh to, to become the person I, tell, I am. I tell people like when people were like, Oh, you can't be natural. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if y'all think I cheated, I'm like this body, like that's the fucking easy shit. Like that's yeah. stuff I like to do. You know what I mean? Like, like talk to me about the PhD. That was way fucking harder. Or, <laughs> or the shit I've been through the last two years. That, that shit, God, that I'll take a diet any day over I'll that. I think it died over some of that life stuff. Me getting sober oh. at age 22 from, crystal meth and, and everything else I was doing. Like, yeah, yeah. I'll take the diet over yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, but, but you know, people are always going to have those, those sorts of thoughts and that's okay, you know, but um, yeah, like that, that business stuff, like if you want to challenge, own your own business, man. If you want to challenge, like it's just, yep. nothing will test you like that. You know? I, I, I hired a coach. Um, his name is Alex Scharf and he's brilliant. He teaches CEOs how to become leaders and build leaders within the company. And he's got this thing called the billionaire code. And this dude puts a system in place that is just like amazing. One of his phrases is your business um, is broken. And if you're doing it right, it always will be because the moment you try to have a perfect business or you can translate it to perfect physique or perfect track record or whatever, um, everything around you becomes uh, lazy. It's like, uh, you know, everything, if, if, once you reach that level, you're not striving for anything else. And you don't, you're not challenging yourself. You're not, you're not digging deep. You're losing it's, sense, it's, sense of your goals. It's funny, uh, Paul, like after all this shit that's happened, to, some people have heard about my personal problems and also business issues I've had in the last couple of years. And um, Paul told me, he's like, you know what? People don't know you have no idea. Like this is, you know, you're actually going to come back way stronger from this because you do better when you have a chip on your shoulder and you feel like somebody when, he's like, when somebody he's like, you're like, you know, you know, Michael Jordan did this. Like he made up, like any, he would take anything. The opposing, like the most innocuous statement, the opposing team would make and he would use it as fuel. Yeah. You know? I'm like that. Like some people think it's not real healthy, but Paul's like, when you've actually got somebody out to get you, yeah. oh man, like you're like, look out. Yeah, well, they, have you ever heard the phrase, um, a setback is a setup for a comeback? A comeback, yeah, it's exactly. It's a good one. Well, a lot of and that's, you know, um, I think a lot of people, they go through those times in their life, you know what I mean? And it, it, some people, they, because trust me, there were days where I was like, man, it would be so much easier if I just didn't care. Like, uh, I would just like to not care. Unfortunately, I'm a very caring person. I care a lot. Yeah. So, um but yeah, sometimes you would just rather be numb when it's like that difficult of a situation. But you know, you just, I, I put up a post about this the other day. I said, you know, the biggest thing is, is like, you're always going to go through ups and downs in your life. And it's never, your life's never going to be as good as the highest high. It's never going to be as bad as the lowest low, but it's always going to oscillate. You know what I mean? And sometimes you're fucking crushing it. When you're fucking crushing it, keep crushing it. Keep it going. But when you're, when you're in a really low place and everything feels like it's fucking collapsing, and you feel like you're at the hole at the bottom of the universe, and then the black hole emerges and pulls you further in. Um, keep your just keep your feet churning. Just keep your feet churning. Like 
just just be that running back who's got like five guys on him, but just keep your feet churning. Yep. Because what's going to happen is, unless you're dead, life never stays bad forever. No. So um, eventually you are going to come out of whatever thing you're dealing with, whether it's the, the death of a loved one or, you know, you lose a business or you lose two businesses in my case, or, you know, a divorce or anything like that, like, or, or drugs or whatever, like, you're going to come out of that at some point. So keep showing up, keep your, keep your legs churning, keep doing, even if you don't feel like it, keep doing the things you need to do because when you come out of it, at least now you've got that momentum built up. Yeah. Now you're not trying to undo six months of you laying on the floor in the fetal position, not doing anything, right? Yeah, and that's what I tell my, the, my mentor, um, life coach clients is that you just put your left foot in front of your right foot, you do the next right thing, and you just left, right, repeat, left, right, and just keep on going. And it doesn't matter how small the next right thing is, if it's journaling or if it's a gratitude list or if it's taking a couple big, deep fucking breaths to get you through an aggravating moment, it could be something minute as long as you go forward and take yeah. action, like you're going to get out of it. Eric Thomas had a great speech, you know, it's so basic. It really is so basic. The people need to hear it. And, you know, every hu he's like, I know you have the power to get through this because you're human. Every human has the ability to get through whatever they're going through if they just decide to do it. Yeah. Get Push through it. Get through it, right? Like even when all this shit was happening, I, in the back, there was this little voice in the back of my mind going, oh, but the comeback story is going to be so good on this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So... <laughs> So let me um, ask you, I, I do know, I do know you, I mean, we know each other. I know your story. I follow you. And, um, s some things have happened in your personal life and your business yeah. life a, a lot, some, some heavy shit. And yeah. you still found time to write a book. <laughs> you, f you still were able to have the wherewithal to, to, to separate somehow the emotional stress and, and the chaos I to, didn't always, but to, to it focus, was, it was just you know forcing myself down in front of that keyboard and saying, "All right, we're we're doing this day." You know, what's funny is people like I got uh, interviewed on a podcast the other day. Like, what inspired the book? And I said, "Desperation." Uh, you know, I got when I lost my second business, there went seventy percent of my income in one day. You know, what I mean? and just like that. And there was a point at which. Um, you know, there was litigate, uh, there was litigation involved and there was a point at which I owed more to attorneys than I had available in my bank account. That was a pretty shit feeling. You know what yeah. I mean? And, um, I, uh, so, but you know what? It was like, so my friend Peter Baker, he was like, well, have you ever considered writing a book? And I was like, well, shit. No, but I'm considering it now. Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> people would always, you know, ask me when I was going to write a book. And I said, you know, I think I'd like to do a contest prep book because there's nothing really out there that's comprehensive for contest prep. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. And um, so I there's started body building, There's bodybuilding. There's dieting. There's there's the Atkins yeah. and the South Beach, but there's nothing comprehensive, like you said. Yeah. And and so I started out. I'm like, you know, this will probably be because I already had the, the ultimate contest prep guide that was out there. You know, uh, I was like, well, we'll make it around it's probably about 100 pages. You know, probably about 100 pages. Well, I, I, it, I think it was like 280 or something, wasn't it? 264, yeah. yeah. So uh, we get 100 pages in like the first like two weeks, you know. We wrote this thing in eight weeks, you know. We, we just, from the day we decided to do it, it was written in eight weeks. Um, we Now, obviously, there was drafts and we went through and edited sure. it. We did the, the, you know, the formatting and all that kind of stuff. Um but yeah, it just like once I started going, it just flowed. And I remember like as I was writing it, I was so happy. Like because I knew it was gonna be good. Like I knew it was gonna be good. I knew it was gonna be such a game changer. And it just felt so good to be in that space like I was it's five, six years ago where I was putting out content and people were really excited and they wanted to hear what I had to say. And then when we did the pre-sale, we sold a thousand books on pre-sale in the first 24 hours. That's awesome. And it was just, that was also like that day, a couple of the things actually like lined up together. Um, and 
like that was the start of things starting to turn around. You know what I mean? And yeah. Yes. The, don't don't get me wrong. Like having some financial security from that helped, but more so, it just it. I was positive again, you know. And I had I had so many people tell me like, "Man, you just seem like you're back because you're yeah. happy and you're you're positive and you're." You're focusing on content. You're focusing on doing the stuff that really made you popular, you know? And, uh, you know, I let myself get a little bit sidetracked and forgot about, like, what my purpose is and what, what people really liked about me. You know what I mean? So, yeah, like, I, I love writing the book. And, you know, I still, like, I even referenced it the other day. We were, uh, Holly and I were working on some seminars. We're going to Thailand doing some seminars over there. And I even referenced the book the other day. I'm like, man, this is so nice because they got like all this stuff in one place. I don't even have to think about it, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it was, um, and then, you know, what felt really great was when I started getting, you know, I had some experts read over it, like James Krieger, Alan Argon, yeah. so he, uh, Brett Contreras, um, John Romanello, like it, everybody's feedback was just, holy shit, this thing is awesome. Yeah, and it is. It's a great, it's a, it's a great book. And the, the one thing when you were, when you were talking about it, our entire conversation, this is being recorded. You can go back and watch it. And you've, you know, you've been answering and you got, you know, we're talking. But when you started talking about this book, it's like the lighting changed and like <laughs> your, your glow, um, you just, your, your energy shifted and you're resonating at a different frequency right now. And, and you use the word purpose. Um, and I, I, so I think there's two parts of this is number one, yes, is, is knowing what your purpose is and, and be, taking action that is in line with your purpose um, in order to be, word number two, um, fulfilled, to yeah. have fulfillment in your life. And, and what I'm seeing in you now is this energy, which is just a representation of you being fulfilled because you're in line with your purpose. And that, that, that's kind of what I see. That's the things that I, that's where I go with this. I go to yeah, this. I mean, you know, like. I want to make a good living to support my kids and, you know, have fun and have more flexible. Like, but I've had a lot of money. I've lost a lot of money. I've, you know, it didn't make me any happier. Uh, and I still drive my car I had in grad school, my 2003 old Alero. Really? Yeah, I still drive the same car, you know. I'm probably the least flashy guy rolling up to these bodybuilding contests. But, you know, for me – like, and not to say I don't spend money on anything, like, but most of the stuff's business. Like, I just, I really enjoy what I do. Um, but it was, yeah, that book reminded me what my purpose was. You know, and it's, it's funny. I was listening to a Tony, Tony Robbins speech about a year ago, and, um, and I kept playing it over when all these things were going on. And one thing he said was, the worst thing in your life can become the best thing in your life if you decide to use it. And that yep. is exactly what happened, right? So this started off as a desperation, holy crap, I gotta find a way to make some income so I don't go broke from paying attorneys. Um, and it turned into, wow, I'm really enjoying this. I'm really like finding my passion again for this. Hell, it made me even think about competing again, you know, and I haven't competed in bodybuilding in, in like almost eight years, you know, oh, so. Wow. Um, you know, it was just really, yeah, I, I, I remember, you know, I was writing it at my desk and Holly and I worked side by side and um, I'm like, like, like a little, she's like very focused when she works. I tend to, like, I'm a, I'm a squirrel, you know, and uh, I kept interrupting her workflow because I'm like, oh, they check out this portion of the book. This is so awesome, you know, and she's like, yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. And eventually she had to be like, all right, you're going to have to go right in there. And show it to me at the end of the day, and I'll be working here. But yeah, it was just you know I was so excited about it. I just I knew it was going to be good, and um, it has. How, how, how many copies have you sold so far, Lane? Uh, we're approaching five thousand. So you've reached five thousand people with this book. Have yeah. you gotten feedback from people who have read it and use applied it for their contest prep or for with their clients for contest prep? There are people currently using it for contest prep. Uh, a couple of coaches have actually reached out and said, wow, thank you so much. This is a great reference guide for me, you know? Um, but, you know, we just started selling it in, uh, you know, it's been out for a month. I was going to say, wasn't it like end of February that you 
He launched uh, on March. I think we released it on on like March. Hang on, it was a Tuesday. It was the first first Tuesday in March. Let me let me check here. I'll get you an exact date. It would have been the sixth of March we released it. Five thousand. That that's great that you've that you've managed to affect that many people with with it. I, I was reading and um the one thing that I like is um so like when we when we dial in the macros for our clients, there's a number of ways that we can do it, right? We can go with TDEE, we you know which is it's a it's a guess. It's a, I mean, it is a guess. It's yes. an educated guess, right? But like, we very well could like I I watched uh, a video Helms did like maybe three or four years ago. How like we'll start at TDE, maybe body weight times twelve, and then if they're losing, we'll actually add fifty carbs and see if they keep losing. And we'll keep on adding calories until they stop losing, so that we have them at the highest possible level. And I've always liked that. Um, but you can do body weight times 12, body weight times whatever. You can do the TDE. You can do a number of different things. And what, what you did is you actually – I didn't scroll down low. I got, grabbed a calculator, and I started doing the math based on how you were doing it. And then you're like, figure out the protein, and then let's just – carbs and fat, whatever, you know, wherever you get in, whatever sustainable, whatever food choices, whatever helps you perform. You had like a list of six bullet points that are like, here's how you decide if you're going to go with carbs or fat for those extra – calories once you have your protein so i'm like okay i'm 40 years old so i'm at 2.4 2.6 so per kilo i've got 188 pounds so 77 kilos and then i'm doing the math and then i scroll down slightly i'm like oh here's a fucking chart great yeah <laughs> and I yeah just, and that's and that's you know when i was doing it i'm like i'm thinking not everybody's good at math lane you're gonna you know, lose a lot of math in your book you're, there is a lot of math I'm like, you're going to lose half your audience. So that's why I, I put those tables in there as quick reference so people can just go, okay, I need, I want to, I need to lose this much. Okay, here's my weekly calorie deficit. Yeah. Right? Okay, I want to do 60% carb, 40% fat, and I'm at this calorie level. Okay, boom, here it is right here. Right? So I just wanted to make it so easy for people. But I also wanted to understand how I got to that. Yeah, sure. Right? So that you can do, if you don't want to do the math, you don't have to do the math. It's all in there. But if you want to, you know, do the math and understand how I got there, it's also all there. Yeah. So I, I mean, we all learn different ways, right? So like some people want to do the math and some people just need the answer. It's like macros versus meal plans. It's like, just tell me what to fucking eat. Like, yeah. that's, if, you know, like that, I just want to know my number lane. I don't want to have to, you know, but I can do it. But where, you know, you might sell this book to a coach. And that coach should be, you know, doing the math and, you know, have a system. Whereas the uh, client or an end user, eh, give me the, give me the table. Give me the, give me the intro. And that's yeah. why I want to do it that way. You know, even in peak week, you know, the peak week chapter, we have a bunch of tables and charts and everything. So you can see, Oh, okay. I'm a physique competitor. I doing this. Okay. Right here. Here it is. Right. So it just, it really simplifies the process for a lot of people. And, you know, is it going to be as good as a normal coach? Well, maybe sometimes. Um, if you have a really great coach, if you're working with somebody really good, no, it's probably not going to be as good as that. Yeah. But, hey, for 50 bucks, <laughs> one, you're, you're going to be able to coach yourself at least a little bit. And two, you're going to learn a lot more. And if you have a good coach, you're going to feel better about it because it's going to give you confidence in the process because you're going to understand why they do certain things certain ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you thought about branding it like the, uh, the lane method, the bio lane. So like uh, other coaches could be like, you know, I uh, actually, I subscribe to the bio lane method and, and oh wow, I've heard of that. And now you have a certification lane. I'm such a terrible marketer. <laughs> I'm such a terrible marketer. It's funny, you know, I've start, I've you know kind of ushered in several trends in the fitness industry. I forget who I was talking to, but he I think it was Mike McCann. He's like, you realize you should be worth like twenty million dollars, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, you know, uh, I am, I I, I am in, inside. <laughs> but you know, I just like to give people information. But no, I mean, we could talk about branding it. Something fits. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I just ha I just happen to know a digital marketer I can put you in touch with that might help you blow this thing up. Yeah, sure. I'd be interested in it. Yeah. You know, that's that's the thing is like I, you know, I want to reach more people. Obviously, yeah, I want to make more income, but also like I just like having a bigger platform because then I can help more people. Absolutely, and that's that's what it comes down to. I mean, that's why we changed the mission of our company 
to, to basically, we gauge the success of our company based on the success of our clients. And that's the only metric that we use because helping people, when you help people, when you help people and you genuinely, like, authentically care about them, that comes oh, back. Yeah, that, no, that stuff, that shows up. And, and yeah. the great thing is, not only does it take care of itself and not, does it just show up, it becomes a lot less relevant. When you're happy on the inside because you're fulfilling your purpose and you're actually contributing to people's happiness and you get to, there is a, making somebody happy, helping them reach their goals, getting that, 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 that feeling of knowing that it was because of you and, and they were willing and there was trust and it happened and you did something to change their life for the better. That is something you cannot buy. And there's a, there's another sense of accomplishment that comes along with, that level of help where the money is like, okay, that's great. It's great. But now I'm fulfilled in a different way. I'm fulfilled over here. And that means a lot more. And usually they go hand in hand. You know, I like what Dave Ramsey says. If you, if you treat people like people and don't treat them like dollar signs, the money takes care of itself. It does. And I've, I've been on both sides of that. I've, I was a few years ago in a bad place in my life where um, I don't want to go too far into it, but I felt like I had to make a certain amount of money every month and a certain amount of money every year. And, uh, I started chasing that number. And, um, you know, it, I got, I was a worse coach because of it. You know, I was a much worse coach because of it. And um, it, it made me feel bad on the inside because I knew I wasn't doing the best job I possibly could. And, um, you know, that, that was hard for me to reconcile as somebody who railed against bad coach. I don't want to say I was a bad coach, but I just – you know, I didn't have that same level of passion for it. And it's nice to, I'm kind of finding that again. So what, what, um, what turned it around? Was there a, a one thing or a series of things that helped you get away from that understand of that, that chasing the money um, as a primary and the client secondary to, to having that, that epiphany or that realization, like, wow, I've gotten far away from this and I need to get back to it. Uh pretty much losing everything and then realizing that, Oh, you know, because yeah, some bad shit happened to me, but also a lot of it was my fault. You know, I'm not a bad person, but I made some bad decisions yeah. and, you know, and, and also trusted the wrong people and those sorts of things. And, and when you make bad decisions and um, you make poor choices, um, they add up, you know what I mean? And, uh, and you don't deal with certain things in your life and you let them kind of fester and accumulate. That's what happens. And so at the end of the day, um, I realized that a lot of the stuff was, dude, this is you. And this is just an accumulation of you doing things the wrong way the last few years. So let's go back to when we were fucking killing it and replicate what we were doing then. Because I still have all the same talents and abilities and all that kind of stuff. And I still have the same passion for it. So let's just go do that again, right? So, and it's kind of as simple as that. And it's kind of like what you said about Tony Robbins saying the worst thing in your life can turn out. And I just saw Tony a month ago and uh, he, he, that, that same thing came up. You know, the, the lowest point in your life could actually be the one thing that propels you to the, it, looking back, could be the one, th- like me, a recovering drug addict, like if you would have talked to me 20 years ago about, how blessed am I to be a recovering meth head? Like yeah. that gratitude was nowhere in that. Well, Aaron, Aaron Singerman, Aaron Singerman owns Redcon One. He was uh, he was a drug addict as well. Like he was homeless, living out of like uh, abandoned buildings. You know, it's just what you choose to do with it. You know what I mean? Like I always tell people, like I know everybody's got something. Everybody's had. Everybody's got a struggle. I get it. You know what? Maybe you started on the 80 yard line. Maybe somebody else started on the 20 yard line. Maybe somebody else started on the 10 yard line. It, it don't matter. So I don't care how hard you had it. Somebody came from worse and did better. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. You know That's what I mean? It exactly. That's, That's it. it. I've had certain challenges in my life. By no means have I had the most challenges of anybody out there. There's somebody who came from worse and did better than me. That's 100% true. Absolutely. You know, and so that's when you put that kind of thing in perspective. It's just, just go to work. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's, that's what I've done the last, uh, the last year. And well, I think it, it's time to pay off. To me, it sounds a lot like it, it ownership, um, owning your, your, owning your language, your behavior, your actions, your environment, and just owning your self 
and, and take, taking ownership of everything. So you're not, not a victim. And, and like you saw an opportunity, like, you know what, like shit is not working. And if it's going to work, I'm the one that has to fucking make it work. So yeah. What can I do? And then it's that left, right, left, right that we talked about and just keep moving forward towards doing what the old lane used to do to become and get the success. It, yes, money, but also client and notoriety and, and, right. impact and influence and, you know, and potential, like do those well, things. And, and, and I'll, 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 I'll kind of leave it on this. Cause I think you brought up a very important point. I'll kind of, I think this is a good one to close on is victim mentality versus hero mentality. Okay. Victim mentality is bad things happen to me. I can't stop them. There's nothing I can do. Hero mentality is I don't care what happens to me. I am in control. You know, I may not be in control of everything that happens to me. I am still in control of how I respond. That's it. So you, you can either be a victim. No, nobody's, nobody's coming to save you. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you. And even if they do, if somebody feels sorry for you, what does that help you with? It doesn't do anything. It help you. It's, it, it's nothing. People's pity is nothing. It's bullshit. Right? So go to fucking work. Right? I, I'm not going to sit here and say I never had days where I was like feeling sorry for myself and say, why did this happen to me? I never, I never like, you know, punched anybody. I never assaulted anybody. You know, I've never done a really evil thing to somebody, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Um, I've never purposely tried to hurt someone, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, it was, nope, you made some really poor choices. Um, you didn't handle some things very well. And you know what? This is probably the accumulation of that. And so if you start making good choices, you can pull yourself out of this shit. Yeah. So I just made the decision. I was going to start making good choices and continue to do that. Our consequences is just a symptom of our decisions, man. And yep. it sounds like you're moving on the right path, especially with this book. It, you know what? It's easy to read. Um, it makes sense. There is some math involved, but I like how you lay it out for people. Um, you, you've yeah, somebody, somebody said um, – they said, I really like it because it, it, it sounds – I'm reading it, and I can hear your voice. I, I was able to, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, there's a few times I'm like, oh, that's I'm, – I'm listening to Lane right now. I'm, I'm reading <laughs> Lane's brain right now. So um, we'll wrap up, but if people want to get in touch with you, you know, we have a, a good amount of people on our Facebook page. This is being recorded now. We'll put this up. We'll put a link to it on our website. But how do, um, how do people, you know, how do people, number one, get your book, and then how do they – what are their options for coaching? Like, is, is it just send to your website or what do you want to do? Yeah. So easiest way to get the book. It's easy. Contestprepbook.com. That's it. Contestprepbook.com. And then um, for anything else to do with me, biolane.com. So biolane.com has got, um, you know, we've got my, we've got free articles on there. We've got all my appearance schedule, all that kind of stuff. A lot of content. We've also got a, a paywall, so where you can get premium content as well as our workout builder. Um, and then, uh, you know, on social media, I'm BioLane on pretty much everything except for Facebook, where I'm facebook.com slash Lane Norton. So if you just search Lane Norton, I'll come up as uh, my, my fan page or my athlete page or, or whatever it is. So, yeah, and, and um, reach out to me. I love hearing from people. Um, follow me. If, if you hate me, leave a troll comment. Um, you know, I love those too. So, um, Troll, trolls, trolls are just dirty cheerleaders, man. <laughs> yeah. People though, I, I've had this conversation where I said, I said, who's, who's winning in this situation? You follow me and you hate me. Like, <laughs> that must suck. Yeah. I don't follow anyone I hate. Nope. Well, listen, um, I gotta, I, I gotta say it's been an, an honor to talk to you again. I know we have a working relationship. Um, professional relationship, but I, I always, I always get a lot out of talking to you. If it's at the Olympia, or if it's, uh, you know, wherever I'm happy to run into you. Um, so I really appreciate it. For those of you that are watching this podcast, I would encourage you to check out contestprepbook.com. Um, also, at biolane.com, you had touched on it. Um, you use the word paywall, which I might not bring up that, that exact term um, <laughs> in future podcasts. But what he's referring to is that he has some content that is free. It's really good content. However, if you want – some of the some of the higher level content you're gonna see. There's some things that you can only read so much of. But when you pay, what is it? Five bucks, ten. Uh, so if you pay five bucks a month, you can get all the premium content. If you pay twelve bucks a month, you get all the premium content, plus our workout builder, which is basically 
you can design your own kind of customized workout based on my principles and how I do things for, for, you know, for, for 12 bucks a month, 12 bucks a month. It's, you know what, um, that price point, it's really hard to find that kind of value, especially from somebody who's worth $20 million on the inside. <laughs> like, so, if, if, awesome. you guys, if you guys that are watching this need, uh, you want some really good content, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you over to biolane.com. Sign up for his subscription because it's gonna blow your mind. And there's, it's, it's more than just fitness. It's more than just bodybuilding. It's more than powerlifting. It's more than weightlifting. More than than dieting. So um, he's got a lot of good insight. You guys will be uh, really well served to sign up for that and um, and reach out to him on these other things. I'm gonna post all of these in the thread so people can click them and they can reach out to you if they want. But again, Lane, it's always a pleasure. And um, I feel honored to have had work with you in the past. And it's because of you that I am where I'm at right now. Without you in my life at the, in the early stages, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been introduced to macros. I wouldn't have been um, as enthusiastic about the things that I find passion in right now as I am. So, um, and for those of you that don't know, it's only because of Lane Norton that our macro calculator at IIFOM.com has the fiber added. I don't know if you remember this, Lane, but I messaged you. I'm like, hey, check out this calculator. I added a fiber feature. What are you thinking? You're actually like, that's actually not terrible. I, I really like that. So it's because of Lane that we have fiber in our calculator from seven or eight years ago. So thank you again, Lane. I really appreciate, appreciate it. Tell Holly I say hello. And well, uh, you have, have a great night, and uh, I, I guess I'll talk well, to you soon, right? Well, I see you, Philippia. You know what? No. Um, I've been going to Burning Man every year, and Burning Man is – we get home from Burning Man, and it's like a week later is the Olympia. And to go from being a naked hippie in the desert dancing at <laughs> EM for 20 hours a day straight to the freak show, that going from one freak show to another, it's <laughs> too big of a thing to get my head around. And it's like, I'm going to hang out with the hippies and then just chill the fuck out for a while. <laughs> So I've made a decision, um, no more Olympia, because it's just too, it's too, too much. Well, hopefully I'll see you out in Arizona sometime, but it's been an honor for me. You've always been very supportive. Uh, I'm very happy to see all the success you've had. Uh, it makes me very happy. Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. And you have a, have a great night, okay, brother? All right, Anthony. Take care, man. All right, bye-bye.